so now that we know what the vision would be and we know what the obstacles are, um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Ian, who's going to guide you through the rest of the session. So, as Alex mentioned, uh, we, we've kind of identified a lot of the, well, everybody has a very different vision as to where they see robotics going in the future and the hurdles that are in the way. Um, one important thing, though, is that uh, among our panel members, there are different priorities. And this last question, just to wrap things up, you know where the, what their vision is and the obstacles, but we want to see and have them share with you uh, very briefly, maybe around one minute so that we can open it up for questions. Um, what is your timeline? Given your position, your industry, your background, having identified those challenges and with the vision that you've shared with us, what are your short-term, medium, and long-term goals? Like, what is the big problem that you're going to face next, and how do you think you're going to address it? Um, okay, so in the short term, uh, at Myomo, what we've done is we've developed a um, essentially a home clinical and home version of an upper extremity exoskeleton. And so the short-term challenges for us are to um, deploy this in clinics with it then able to bridge into the home. Uh, we've developed a connected health platform based on an Android uh, architecture that collects the, um, the evidence um, for usage so that um, therapists can track compliance, they can uh, measure range of motion more quantitatively than using a uh, goniometer, which is effect essentially a protractor. And um, we're also uh, introducing a set of games because when you see somebody first move their arm again and touch their nose for the first time in sometimes decades, there isn't a dry eye in the room. But um, when they then have to perform repetitive task practice thousands of times to really get the long-term uh, maximum benefit, they get a little bored. So the games are, are fundamental to that. So that's, that's really what our primary focus is over the next year. Uh, our timeline uh, for Colonel Hitch program um, is four years, roughly, and uh, I mentioned the two phases of it. If you split it out, uh, we have a, a BAA hopefully coming out um, uh, in mid, uh, mid fall, early fall, roughly uh, October time frame. Um, the goal there is to do uh, roughly one and a half to two years of core technology development, uh, lots of activities in lots of areas. Um, for the uh, technical uh, parts of interest uh, that we're looking for. Uh, that includes, um, as some of the panel members have mentioned, uh, quantifying uh, parts of the problem, uh, both um, subsystem hardware as well as quantification of why uh, it, it's important to do what the hardware needs to do um, as, they're, as they begin to look like pieces of a suit. Um, and then on the back end, uh, as we finish out the four years, is, is roughly two, two and a half years of integrated suit development, where you bring those core technologies together um, and uh, and create one system. So um, uh, those are slices of, of uh, how we see um, our work over the next couple years. But uh, it's it's one to two years within a four-year window of of executing. And the end state is to be able to have. Um, uh, warfighters actually wearing a suit, showing the, the effects of uh, injury mitigation and uh, performance um, enhancement uh, under their typical conditions. And they could be extreme cases like uh, uh, parachuting out of airplanes, uh, oh, more cowbell, um, or uh, normal conditions such as marching or even uh, down to um, uh, normal activities during the day, such as uh, sports. We see a lot of injuries uh, for uh, soldiers in daily activities. Um, if I focus just on two challenges like ease of use, so we develop with our clinical partners improvements in ease of use. At the same time, we want to educate the users, the OTs, the PTs, that we share best practice guidelines that we really know how to apply this technology. On the reimbursement, we're working on reimbursement codes to see what is possible. Can we change? the landscape there uh, and that we have a better cost structure in place for our customers. On the development side, the locum is out for about 10 years, always improved, changed, so this will continue obviously with augmented feedback, virtual reality integrations, additional sensors, so there's a lot of stuff to do, but certainly interesting. 
Yes, uh, at Berkeley Bionics, what we are uh, focusing on, uh, we have realized uh, that um, getting people out of wheelchairs, uh, people with uh, any type of form of uh, paralysis, uh, spinal cord injuries, MS, stroke, is a major challenge. There's a reason why the wheelchair has been around uh, pretty much since, uh, since 1595 as pretty much the only mobility option. We are not going to change this overnight. We are starting now uh, by uh, giving this opportunity uh, in, in rehab to utilize exoskeletons. And that is starting end of this year. Uh, we have a look at this as a, as a journey over the next uh, probably five to 10 years at least until we have uh, a set of different uh, products that will apply to different uh, modalities, uh, both in rehab, uh, but primarily uh, as you get into the home environment. So it's uh, a beginning of an exciting journey that is starting now into this year. Okay. Our company uh, timeline um, as a company CEO, uh, we have a very tight schedule. Uh, we or, or target uh, IPO in Shanghai in three years. Um, probably the product, uh, the first product successful would not be a rehabilitation robot. Any robot would be profitable for us. So uh, maybe uh, a robotics wheelchair variable like a scooter could be very successful in China. But for rehabilitation, um, my point of view is that we, in short term, we would like to simplify our exoskeleton uh, uh, compliant actuation based uh, rehabilitation robot and also for the upper extremity training and also lower extremity pedal based uh, virtual environment uh, uh, simulation uh, based system uh, could be a product that we will put in the market uh, in the short term. Long term, we like to uh, have our robot sitting in the family uh, and it can be fun for recreational game and also training. So a therapist, uh, a therapist could be in a hospital stay remotely to watch through telepresence technology. And the system could be also at the countryside in, in China you know, uh, or in Canada. Um, and a cheap, functional, uh, would be fun to use uh, through the virtual space, uh, telepresence technology for monitoring and uh, intelligent detection, uh, feedback, and adaptation, uh, building in the pr uh, training procedures. So that's for our long-term goal, our dream. Thank you. So I think I've been really working on the middle part, which is really in this process of a device to uh, industry acceptance, you know, cl clinical outcomes, uh, surrogate outcomes. Um, also a little bit, I mostly as a neurologist, I apply and test robots or technology, I'm happy to do. But I think um, besides a device push, that there needs to be a sort of a clinical need pull. So to be able to inform the, the development of some of these devices now, and they're really developing at a pretty exciting rate. So kind of in that middle ground right now, well, we're continuing our current funded project, but we're beginning to work on two ideas. Um, I agree with Ross that um, we can get a certain amount, uh, 10, 20% increase, uh, depending upon what outcome measure you use, but how can we go further than that? Um, and so I think perhaps part of the future might be in combination therapies, whether it's peripheral stimulation or central stimulation or a combination of both. Using that, can we nudge up our uh, outcomes uh, and get better outcomes? And also, very importantly, to look at who should we use this on? You know, we make a mistake in using it on everybody in a category of stroke or everybody in a category of TBI. But I'm not sure that that's the way we should go in the future. Thank you. Uh, so short term at, at Tibion, uh, you know, being um, you know, a year and a half commercial here, it's an interesting phase in the lifespan of a company, right? You know, um, we, we don't have the, the luxury of a, a lot of the, the clinicians and, and, and academics who have backing and, and are able to find uh, grant support and support through their organizations, right? In a company, 
you're driven um, by, by the results and the early results that, that you achieve. So it's a really interesting dynamic at work. And our short-term goals are, are really focused on identifying those users that can apply the technology successfully. And, and to be honest, that model, it really varies clinics to clinics. Some love it outpatient. Others are finding that it works great in their inpatient program to get people up and early mobile. So really understanding those key experiences and developing those intimate customer relationships uh, is, is a key emphasis for us this year. Um, you know, be, beyond that, we, we need to move toward a direction where, where we can iterate the next version of the device. So really understand what improvements need to be made by listening to these clinicians. Some will use it in a wellness model as part of a, of a gym membership. Uh, other relationships take us uh, into exploring the, the home market, as, uh, as Steve and others have uh, alluded to. Uh, so with that, I uh, pass on. So I'm probably going to take the short-term, medium, and long-term and perseverate a little bit on clinical trials, because I still think we need to show in this world that it works. So from a short-term perspective, I think we need to refine our outcome metrics, as has been said. If we know that it's actually doing something or hope, we got to be able to show it and show it makes a difference. In the medium term, I think we have to refine this concept that's been talked about by some of our colleagues about responders. Who, when, dosing, timing, um, and, and also this concept of complementary therapy. Maybe it's of great use in a specific population of therapy, but maybe this plus another intervention is even better. Or perhaps it's not as good, and we need to know that. And then I think long term, we need to be able to deliver some of this, as people have said, to the home and the clinic. It has to be cost effective. It has to show some elements of superiority, and it has to change quality of life. And yes, I'm still wearing the Superman cape. Okay, um, let me ask a question of you, and you can raise your hand. Who've heard of Promise, NeuroQual, um, the Toolbox, or Critical Data Elements? Good, okay. That's, that's important because we're all talking about outcomes here. In NIH, the last almost eight years, for example, in Promise has invested approximately $50 million to develop something. And the idea, you think about it like temperature, that everybody's been using something else to look at what's happening in terms of, in this instance, it's the patient's reported outcome measure related to health quality in some different domains. As I mentioned earlier, it's sort of in the physical, um, social, and the cognitive areas. And the concept is a cultural shift, if you will, in terms of how we look at something. If everybody's using a different measure and they say their, me their particular system works, where are we? You know, you know, who are you going to believe, you know, in terms of how do, you, how do you do things? Now, function sometimes is standard or a biological assay is much more stable. Um, and then how much do you put into things like promise? But I think this is an area, and one of the things you mentioned was timing again is that the earlier, one of the earlier keynote lectures said, if it, within 10 years we don't get this data together where we're looking at how, how good we're doing or if we're doing better, or at least monitoring the system closely, we're gonna be in, in not so good shape. And the way technology moves today, my impression is, how many times do you change a laptop now? It's every two to three years. And that's even moving quicker for handheld devices and other things. So I think part of that, again, I think we can catch up, if you will, through the teaming aspects. But I think that's really important to look at those different aspects. Excellent. So at this point, we'd like to open up uh, the, the discussion to the audience. And we encourage people that have questions to raise your hand. We'll bring up the mic. You can address individual panel members or the panel as a whole. Anyone? Uh, George Wittenberg from the VA in Maryland and University of Maryland. Um, it's a very interesting discussion, and I, I wonder um, on, on one very specific point, whether there's too much optimism about um, selecting patients for particular technologies and interventions, because um, you, know, you have a wide variety of, of interventions that are, that are fairly complex. You have an even more complex nervous system and um, 
and biological system in which that nervous system is placed, what, what's the real likelihood that some feasible set of tests will actually have a predictive value to the point in which you can tell a person, um, you can't have this intervention because our you know, study shows a 1% chance of, of success, and will they accept that as an individual? And you know, how, can you, how can your medical system end up um, to, you know, deciding when it, you know, it can't even decide who gets botulinum toxin or who gets a you know, particular oral medication for stroke prevention? I'll take a shot at it. I think it's an excellent and well thought out question. The reality of the issue is that we can talk about things, but we haven't been able to refine that uh, very much. But let me let me take a, a different approach to it. Let's let's look at an example of, of, of pharmacotherapy where I, I, I think I know a little bit about traumatic brain injury clinical trials. And and what we've been doing is taking all severe patients, people with uh, GCS uh, three through eight plumbing them as severe with very different sorts of neuroimaging portfolios um, and known uh, outcome metrics that are very different. And we resulted with mostly clinical trials that weren't that good uh, as far as positive outcomes. They may have been good and well done, but they weren't um, the outcome that we always hoped for. So the question is, can we develop some broad categorization of people who are less likely to respond. Now, we all live, and I think Lou said this eloquently, in a much more financially constrained world. It may not necessarily, not worrying about Big Brother, um, be my choice if I have a 1% efficacy chance. Maybe if I want to pay for it myself. I don't know. But I think it's very much incumbent on us to look at um, are there specific populations of people who, in the reverse, really should get an intervention, who we should advocate for, should have something in the positive, that it will make a positive difference for them? And I think that this route of whether we can parse this apart well enough is yet to be explored adequately. I don't know if anybody else... No? Somebody? Um, I, I do think we're fairly optimistic. Um, I guess we have to be kind of altruistic about it, but the, the fact is we do see people that respond very well and people that see nothing, some people that get worse. So the question is, can we, help, can we somehow understand that? I, I think, take another analogy from a different field, in MS, there's all these interferons with a 33% rate of response. And it's more likely that some people respond really well and some people don't respond at all. But I think the problem here is from the pharma industry, they, don't not, they do not want to limit their market. So they have no interest, actually, in identifying non-responders. So this could be the case as well for industry here, where they want everybody to get a robot because they sell the most product. So I think from an altruistic standpoint, as scientists, if we, and we have, if say we have limited resources, um, we have to be somewhat optimistic because the reality is some people respond really well, some people don't. In the day we may not be able to identify it at all. I, I know a lot of the imaging stuff, you know, we don't end up with a whole lot, but, but I think there is a possibility there. I think uh, from our perspective, obviously, what we are doing is a very young uh, experimental uh, industry. And uh, our approach has been to uh, really take a pretty broad approach here and say, okay, uh, who's suitable for these exoskeletons? And uh, it's, um, we kind of don't want to limit it too much at this point in time. Uh, people with uh, upper arm, uh, with, with uh, arm strength, hand strength, uh, give, give, give it a try. Uh, work with, uh, in the, our trials, with as many hospitals as possible that we can manage so early on. So we, we, we are actually going with 10, all the leading hospitals uh, in the country pretty much and uh, to uh, really give them a chance to experiment as well. But then, as we get closer and closer uh, to commercializing these type of technologies, is to come, obviously, with much better guidelines uh, in terms of selection uh, that provides the best, uh, best outcome. But um, uh, at the moment, uh, at least we, we've taken the route of uh, not excluding too many. But we do realize that uh, there's going to be quite a what the difference between uh, individuals, how, how successful it will be. And it's important to focus uh, once we 
we get to the commercialization stage. Any other questions? Um, hi, I'm Carolyn Stolpe. I'm a graduate of Purdue. Um, I noticed in the discussion that there's a trend of focusing on the, pa the patient's um, disease or the impairment. Um, and I was just wondering how we can create that overlap between automation and design and the personalized care plan. Excellent question. Uh, so at uh, Tibion, uh, the bionic leg, well, our, our approach has been to try and discern patient intent, right? We don't want the robot merely actuating a pattern, right, and, and providing that repetition over and over. We want the intervention to be customized as possible to what that patient is trying to do. So the heart of the device uh, in the Tibion bionic leg is a sensor that's worn in the patient's shoe. The robot won't kick in, won't provide any assistance unless the patient begins with some activation on their own, right? So they, they need to initiate the movement. And I think you touched on something that's a, it's a great point for those of us who are in the business of developing robots is what, what can we do to make the robotic intervention more personalized and, and better fitting, fitting more patients. So if that patient has a kind of a slow pattern and sit to stand and that, you know, somehow about naturally they want to do that movement, you know, maybe slower than most, this robot enables them to, to do it at their speed and it doesn't put them through a, you know, just a, you know, speed, so. Anyone else? Um, we've been testing the, um, system that we have is very adaptable. And this is exactly what I meant when I said the systems have to be adaptable and customizable. Um, so that if you want to increase the range of motion, you change the workspace. You make them have to reach further. If you want to um, increase the work that the arm does, if they're lifting cups, you make the cups heavier. Um, that's what I think these robots need to do. And, um, you know, you can, we have a virtual piano. Depending upon what you want the patient to do, you can have them just work in midline or you can have them work across um, both sides. So that's the way um, we're trying to make it customizable for a plan of care. Uh, I guess sometimes people, they have a misconception. They thought the robots uh, can do everything, but which is wrong. A robot can do something. And robot cannot replace doctor. So the, uh, when the patient gets disease, uh, first thing, go to see doctor, uh, take medicine. And what robot can do, a robot can help to do some, uh, some process repetitive training, uh, need strength, need time and which human uh, therapist cannot sustain in a long term uh, could cause injury. So when a patient has certain case like a robotics can help, I think first we need to distinguish is the cognitive problem or just you know, uh, mo uh, motion uh, motor, train, uh, motor behavior problem. So we could have used the robot to, to do the rehabilitation uh, to recover the motion. Uh, and also to help par recover partial the recognitive uh, skills so that robotics can do. We need to design different systems, different process to attack that. And uh, robotics technology can help uh, training process in some way, but cannot solve all the problem. So we need to be smart on this. Okay. We have time for one more question. Uh, good afternoon, uh, John Fogel in uh, Berkeley Bionics. Um, you know, one of the things I've noticed in the panel's discussion was a, a distinction between um, really who these robots are targeting. And I think it's important to get this out because uh, if you're not really, but well, let me just put it this way. Are we, are we building these robots for the medical community, for the doctors, for the physical therapists, or are we building these robots for people who are actually using these robots for whether it be mobility or you know, experiencing the rehab? And I, 
I, I don't want this to seem semantic. I think the reason it's an interesting question is people are scared of robots. And I think it's a very different experience if a robot is walking you versus if you are walking a robot, right? So the question of who's really in control. And I'm wondering if the panel would like to comment on, you know, what are we really trying to target with these, uh, with these robots, the, the uh, medical community or the, and, and patients? I think you hit on something that's that's key and, and, and in some sense a very, very emotional uh, connection with, with the robots that, that many of us uh, have. I, you know, I think all of us from industry um, can, can speak to a story where we've been in the room with the robot and a patient, right, where it's not about the robot, it's about the patient. I mean, to be up in, um, in, in Maine, in a, in a medical center up in Maine and see a, a global aphasic uh, stroke patient you know, uh, who, who the, the wife came up to me afterwards and said he was falling asleep in rehab. And you put the robot on him, and the guy took his first steps and did a sit to stand. You know, the, the woman's in tears. It, you know, it's, it's, it's really remarkable. So I think those kinds of connections are, are key and clearly to me demonstrate that it's all about the, the patient and less about the robot. I don't know if, I'm sure, you know, I know Dr. Bircher and, and, and Steve have had similar experiences, I'm sure. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's a really um, interesting challenge. Um, the facilities and the knowledge and the expertise is in the clinic, um, and yet the healthcare system doesn't really fund the dosing that's needed for people to make the progress that, that um, they're capable of making. So um, the requirement on the product is you end up needing something that has two very different sets of requirements. Um, the home is, is you know, an unstructured environment, and the requirements on the product are, um, are very different, you know, not just from a safety point of view, but from a compliance point of view. Uh, how do you know? Uh, we're talking about you know, often people who are neuro neurologically impaired. How do, they, how do you know that you're doing it correctly? So you, that's where the role of the software is, the, you know, Connect, uh, Microsoft Connect, like gaming um, that can put you in the picture and, and give you uh, auditory and visual cues to be more compliant, that, that type of thing. So um, it's a big challenge, and you know, I know we make um, trade offs uh, frequently in terms of we get feedback from a therapist and they're treating a different patient every 40 minutes all day long using the same device. Well, they have one set of requirements. And then we have somebody else that wears it for 40 minutes twice a day, and they have a completely different set of requirements. At the end of the day, you have to, um, you know, you have to meet both, but, but they're very, definitely very distinct. Uh, we have an interesting application in that we have to be quite generic in, in, in what our expectations are for a, a, a suit applied to um, a warfighter use. Uh, it's been interesting to hear that uh, uh, custom, customizable, um, and working well for uh, for individual patients is is uh, the theme of the uh, rehabilitation world, and, and we're a little bit on the flip side of having to be uh, adaptable, but definitely not custom because of the uh, wide percentile base we're going to have to serve, including both male and female. Uh, so it's an interesting challenge we have. It's a little bit on the flip side. Just uh, one, one comment on that. You're probably familiar with the, with the ICF in terms of the debate sometimes that goes on about participation and so forth of an individual. It's more individual-centered in that respect. So I think, I think you're right. I think many times, uh, you know, we're looking at certain outcomes, again, based upon, if you will, a medical model or certain functional gains we'd like to see in terms of the efficacy because of the requirements and so forth. What you don't really see a lot of times unless you send something home with someone are those other aspects which makes their activities of daily living or interactions with others um, something they appreciate as a result of, of what they can do and so forth. So I think, again, one of the problems in that area is metrics um, and how do you get something like that and, and make it uh, believable in terms of, you know, those gains in some of those areas are just as important for the individual as maybe some of the uh, other physiological or uh, cognitive aspects. Excellent. So that, that marks the end of our time. 
I invite you all to stay afterwards and, and approach panel members if you have individual questions. Um, we've had the opportunity to really get a really broad perspective on the vision of a very select group of individuals with sharing their ideas of where they see the future of rehabilitation going and what the challenges that we're gonna face along the way as well as their respective timelines. Um, if you could please join me in thanking our panel members uh, for their time. Thank you.